What's good, everybody? It's your boy O'Shea Duke Jackson back with the live collaboration. It's been a while since I've done one of these. And today we are here with a very, very special guest, guys. Well, thank you for being here. We are with Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. I'll let him introduce himself and uh, what his YouTube channel is all about. Hi, right. good, good to see you again, man. Thanks for the invitation. Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, I do the Onyx Report. You can find me, uh, you find my channel under Dr. T. Hassan Johnson. I'm also faculty at uh, Fresno State in Africana Studies, and my primary work as a Black male studies scholar are Black male, males, men and boys. All right, let's give them a round of applause, editors. And unfortunately, um, you know, we're here uh, having uh, a discussion on sad news. Uh, our fellow colleague here in the, in the Black YouTube space, uh, Mr. Kevin Samuels, uh, has passed away unexpectedly. But today we're going to talk about um, a lot of the riffraff concerning his death post uh, post his passing and a lot of the demonization of Kevin Samuels. And I saw that you had made a Facebook post about this, um, but I kind of let you kind of um, um, I'm going to that today. Well, it was it was a combination of things. You know what I mean? Like I was I was seeing people's posts on uh, on all kinds of social media. And one of the things I noticed, of course, is you had a lot of uh, black women, uh, particularly black feminists that came out to dance on his grave. And that was to be expected. Um, but then you also had a wave of black male content providers that were either coming to, you know, kind of eat off off the, the body or to uh, virtue signal, right? To come across, to, you know, basically distance themselves for, you know, from Kevin for clout. And that was one of the things that bothered me because this stuff started happening literally within an hour and a half, uh, at least in terms of what I noticed from, you know, the rumors starting about his passing. So I didn't, I didn't have any verifiable information until about the second day, but I was seeing these videos popping up the very first day within an hour of hearing the rumor. And you already had people posting videos about how much better they were than he because they would never do X, Y, and Z and how rude he was to women. And he must have hated women and hated the black community and X, Y, and Z. And I'm just like, this is sickening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after a while I got fed up and, you know, when I got the, the, the first major article that really, that quoted his mother, uh, that was to me, you know, verifiable information. So when I posted it, I was just going to do a couple of sentences. And the next thing I knew, it was like a short, a short article. So um, I put, I, you know, put it up on my blog and okay. just put it out there. Yeah, let me, um, uh, we were talking offline because uh, I invited you to give your perspective because you are um, a professor over at Fresno State in Black Masculinity Studies. It's a class that you actually teach there. Mm. And you, you made a very interesting point that other black men are looking at the interactions of these particular, especially in, in, in our community, in the African-American community, black community, of how some women are um, handling this. I thought that was very interesting. Why did you make that, um, that observation? Well, one of the things uh, one of the things I've done is I created the concept of black masculinism, right? And I, in so doing, when I talk about black masculinism, which is basically looking at the life of black males uh, empirically and being able to analyze and talk about what black males actually go through, not what the conjecture is or the stereotypes are, but actually listening to black males, looking at the history, looking at the data from a very realistic place. Uh, one of the offshoots of that concept I talk about is the black masculinist turn. And it's a moment where black men have to come to grips with the difference between reality and what we think. So for example, I talk about Ice Cube and his conversation with, um, uh, what is it, the, the, I can't always forget the name of their show, uh, Cocktails with Queens, right? And the conversation they had where you really get to see how visceral and how intense these those black women are mm -hmm. about the difference between black women's lives and the black community. Because if you remember, Ice Cube was talking about a plan for black America. Right. They, they got upset because he didn't talk about black women, but he didn't talk about black men either. Right. That I consider that a black masculinist turn. Many men looked at that and said, oh, there's there's a serious difference between what we thought the black community has been and what it's become. Because we still talk about it in terms of the 70s notion of blackness. But this gender dynamic, especially via black feminism, has changed the game in terms of how many black women see it. What I was saying about Kevin is his passing is going to be another black masculinist turn 
where men are going to be shocked at the the you know the the intensity uh, mm -hmm. the hatred the misandry they're mm -hmm. going to be shocked at the intensity of it. and here's the thing there's mm -hmm. gonna i've seen this already happen 50 times there's a mm -hmm. point where the the rage and and what they're saying veers so far away from kevin it has nothing to do with him and the reason for that is it doesn't mm -hmm. Kevin has become kind of a cipher or or a focal point where misandry can be justifiably extended to black men as a whole via Kevin in a lot of these people's imagination. So they can they, they have license now because again the whole question of Kevin's tone and his his so-called disrespect for black women even though you and I know his whole focus was creating black families, right? But the whole focus on him and his tone has become justified for many of these women to be as misandric as possible. So when you listen closely, they, it doesn't take long for them to veer away from Kevin. And what I was saying about black men who are mm -hmm. looking at this is they start mm -hmm. starting to notice that the, the intensity is really being directed at them. And this is gonna be another moment where black men are gonna pause and look at mm -hmm. this and say, what the hell mm -hmm. is going on? And I really do believe these multiple instances are mm -hmm. going to suggest a major shift and how black men further, you know, e even conceptualize family. I mean, mm -hmm. it, 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 the more you see these kinds of examples, like give you an, another one, for example, when Ayala Van Zant came forward and, and, and you know, pulled away from her own show because she said mm -hmm. these black women were out of order. You know what I mean? These kinds of moments when Rebecca Lynn Pope, you know, said she could no longer, you know, serve as a dating service for black women. Now she, you can see her dancing another tune because black women are her primary bread and butter. Uh -huh. But her point about, Black women's entitlement, which was the same point Ayanna Van Zant was making. Those mm -hmm. are moments. And, and I'm arguing that black men are the ones who are who are, who are really going to be most impacted by each of these successive moments where mm -hmm. you realize that the antipathy toward black men is so intense mm -hmm. to give um, black men pause. And I think the long term effects are not going to be most particularly what women are going to like. What are those long term effects, in your opinion, if you can predict those outcomes? Well, I mean, I think, you know, especially on YouTube, we've already seen the remnants of it happening. You know, when you talk about black men going overseas, when you talk about black men looking to other groups and not necessarily, you know, because I think the popular parlance is that they just go to white women, which, you know, if you've been paying attention, has been debunked. Black men will find women from other countries who are as chocolate as I am or darker that, you know, it, it, but the whole question of going elsewhere, finding other ways to, to match and connect with women to you know kind of escape this misandry that i think is meant in many ways baked into black american culture you're seeing mm -hmm. more of it so on on social media we've seen movements in the, in the last decade or longer where these brothers have been articulating themselves that's why sbm and so on and mm -hmm. so forth, the MGTOW. but here's mm -hmm. the thing black men have been doing that for decades we just never named it mm -hmm. right? i know i know nationalist revolutionaries who've been talking like this since 1988 okay and and they're still as pro-black as they ever were, but their wife is from Ghana. You know, what right. I mean? their wife is from Jamaica. Their wives, are, you know what I mean, from Brazil. This mm has -hmm. been happening, but it reached a crescendo, and especially mm -hmm. in the last decade. Now you got people with hashtags. You got Ibmore. You got all these groups that are naming their issues more specifically. Now that's mm -hmm. just a small percentage, I think, relatively small, who are making content, who are starting to get heard. But as you mm -hmm. have these black masculinist turn moments. Mm -hmm. And more and more brothers are responding and looking mm -hmm. into the groups that are articulating what they're feeling. So if mm -hmm. you're just now seeing all of this visceral response to Kevin Samuels and you're new to it and you're figuring out what you're trying to figure out where all this hostility and why is it being directed toward black men? You're more apt to run into SYSBM. You're more apt to run into Ibmore. You're more apt to run into the Manosphere. You're more apt to even run into older brothers who may not know what those hashtags are but have been participating in those movements because all of them are responding to conditions. They're responding to mating and dating conditions in the black community that I've been saying has been shaped by policy for decades. Mm -hmm. It's coming to a crescendo and it's going to affect black family production. And that's what mm -hmm. we're looking at. Let me kind of go back to one of our interviews that we had. Uh, we've had some pretty good ones on this channel, but you uh, talked specifically about a time when you were teaching i believe your black masculine course black, black masculine, masculine. Yeah. okay i don't know how long it was at the time that you had been teaching this course mm -hmm. when you told me this particular situation but you used to you talk to me about that uh, that some women were taking the course black women 
and that some of the expectations for these young black men at 18 years old that might be college freshmen but that they were expected to have a hundred thousand dollars a year at that time yes right out of high school so i want to i want to match this up to what dr umar johnson has recently said on his last interview mm -hmm. that the problems between black men and black women have been pre-existing for a while and then to follow that up with kevin's message that you know uh, for these women who you know came in to to show on their own recognizance that you cannot receive what you are not and and and, and so he's being demonized for saying okay you want a man that makes a hundred thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. but you're 37 with three kids by three different guys mm -hmm. and you expect that these guys just like that you know an 18 year old guy should have a hundred thousand dollars right you're being a little delusional about that because you're probably not gonna you're probably not gonna get that and so what i'm what, I, what i'm seeing now is that okay black women have a uh the ability to be able to tell black men what what they want like the song i don't want no scrubs is right. very popular. Right. Yeah. Right. but when black men you know kind of iterate what they want it's a problem so what i want to know is this because kevin being demonized so heavily is this a play to try to discourage other black men oh absolutely. Maybe comes okay let's talk about that Oh no, absolutely. And 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 one of the things we got to recognize is this culture of female entitlement is not new and I and I appreciate you bringing that up. No Scrubs was in the 90s. Ain't nothing going on but the rent was one of those songs that came out in the 80s. And it was very similar in tone because all, it was all about what women wanted. I mean, I'm a Gen Xer. I was born in 74, so I was a teenager in the 80s and I remember the rise of the six-figure expectation. I remember the rise of you know the six foot uh you know you had to be six foot tall you had to certain have a certain length penis you had to have x y and z. i remember the rise of that rhetoric by the time it hit the 90s it was already you know fairly well ensconced and women were going to college in record numbers white title i mean a white collar employment was considered the norm even you know we can debate about whether or not it actually was but the values of the culture had grown since the 1980s and, and morphed into something in the 90s. So by the time you get to 2022, it's pretty well established that female entitlement is a norm and thus men responding to it are the problem. Men responding to it are abnormal. And in some respects, it's correct because black men were fairly silent for the last 40 years, but we weren't silent because we were scared or tired or, wouldn't, you know, we didn't have a platform. You know, it, you know, you know what the platform for black men was? Comedians and rappers. So those were the those were the cats we listened to that voiced our concerns. So if you look at Eddie Murphy Raw, right, mm -hmm. where he's talking about Johnny Carson losing half in a divorce, that was red pill. That was men who were frustrated. But we we had to filter that through Eddie Murphy, through Chris Rock, through Dave Chappelle, we to Patrice O'Neal. We had to filter. We had to wait for those comedians, even Richard Pryor, going back to the seventies and eighties. We had to wait for those guys to make those observations in order for that those those ideas to have any traction. And then you had rappers and most of the time in the 80s and 90s these were young cats and they were talking about their environment but they weren't seasoned enough to explain it as well as it needed to be so here's the contrast you got an 18 to 22 year old rapper and feminists at that time who were in the academy were in their 40s with phds so one of the classic moments is when ice cube sits down with dr angela davis i believe this was in the late 1980s or early 90s but was in this time period where they were sitting down because she wanted to talk to him about his sexism. And what he was trying to say was he was responding to, you know, so you hear you had feminism and pop culture and the rise of black women. And he was saying, what you guys are talking about doesn't include the women we're actually dealing with who are setting you up to get robbed or trying to get, you know, pregnant and use you for child support. You know, he was saying, these are the things happening on the ground, but he's arguing with somebody twice his age with a doctorate and who is well known, you know, a well-known activist. That's never going to be more than a mother son discussion. So it took time for, and it's still maturing and developing, you know, where, where black men are being able to articulate themselves. But the biggest problem is we didn't have the platforms. We didn't have magazines. We didn't have talk shows. We didn't have films and TV shows and so on and so forth that got to break down our perspective where people can around the world can resonate with black women's struggle. They can't really do that with black men. The only conversation you have that's international on black men is police homicide and incarceration 
But in terms of black men's experiences with relationships, we didn't have a platform for that. And so the platform that ended up coming about was social media. It was free. It's, it's easy to access as long as you at least had a cheap smartphone. And so now you had brothers who were comparing notes, but it's still maturing and developing because we haven't had 40 years of grants and federal support and university classrooms. You know, mm -hmm. so the, the equivalent to uh, an O'Shea Duke Jackson, I actually sat in those classes with those professors back in the, in the early 90s. You see, you know what I'm saying? So your equivalent back then was a PhD in a university. Whereas mm -hmm. we had to get it out the mud in social media and build it from scratch. I mean, how mm -hmm. long have you been on here having these conversations? How mm -hmm. much support have you gotten from major institutions, universities, no. federal government? No. You had to build this up from nothing, right? right. So, so there's a different maturation process. There's a complete lack of support, even to, to this day, even though you have your Kevin Samuels and you have your O'Shea Duke Jacksons and so on and so forth, how many of these brothers are institutionally supported? You know, whereas black women got that back in the 1980s. And so you, you, mm -hmm. conversations are linked, but one is, is supported and has ascended to a certain level. Um, and, and, and the other is still building and growing organically. But, mm -hmm. but let me ask you this question. If YouTube cut everybody off today, mm -hmm. how impacted would we be? Very. You know, exactly. Whereas with the kind of support that, you know, sisters were getting back in the 80s, you know, especially when you look at Oprah, who just right. opened the ticket to a lot of this, you know, we, we, we don't have that. So we're, we're doing it in a different way. And a lot mm -hmm. of people are upset with how it sounds, but those are also people that haven't had to hear men in decades. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. haven't had to listen, you yeah. know, and it's, it's steadily growing and it's not new. I mean, mm -hmm. even, even the, even the Caucasian guys in the space and the, what would they call the manosphere, they really mm -hmm. got a lot of that from black men in the seventies and right. seventies. Right. Know? Black men have been the canary in the mines for these male issues for generations, but it's only now that we have a microphone and we're able to exchange this information and develop concepts, theories, develop narratives about our experience. It's, it's new to everybody else and it's new to us in terms of developing the language, but the experience isn't new. And so we're trying to craft this and there's so much hostility and rage and some of that hostility and rage, especially for many black women, is that the very idea that they now have to listen to something they've never had to before, mm -hmm. especially if they actually want a relationship because more everyday brothers are starting to hear these talking points and ask different questions. Mm -hmm. In the 80s and 90s, if you wanted to date, you pretty much had to worship women. Now mm -hmm. you've got brothers on a date for the first time asking, okay, well, if you're expecting me to bring X, Y, and Z to the table, what exactly do I get for that? Women exactly. Women had to answer those questions. Right. And there's a lot of hostility and frustration in response to having to do so. And Kevin is the face of that. He didn't develop it, but mm -hmm. he did. He did package it and put it out in a way that, you know, a wider variety, a variety of people had to run into it mm -hmm. and sparking a lot of men, young and old, because Kevin mm -hmm. even talked about old men running up to him and grabbing him and hugging him and thanking him for what he's oh, doing. Oh, yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. men are actually hearing these talking points and saying, well, yeah, he makes a point. And the whole question about whether he's rude or whether he's, you know, hurt people's feelings, that was secondary. If not, you know, that was almost irrelevant to men because we're decades behind finally hearing young black men, relatively speaking, articulating things. Look, I wrote a piece on my blog that had a few of my elder family members call me in tears because mm. I explained something that they had been feeling, but didn't have the, the vocabulary for, right? I wrote a piece on, um, you know, our, why we're generation, generation X fatherless. And when I was writing it too, I was actually writing to other Gen X black men. And I was saying, look, we're the generation that grew up pissed at our fathers, that their absence, we had it all in our rap music, all of that. But in many ways we became our fathers. The marriage rates got lower and they still continue to drop compared to the 1960s and 70s. So we became our fathers. We went to family court. We found out what mothers do to a father and what they can do in response to having institutional support that we don't get. And I was saying, it's time for you to take all that rage, rage and anger that you have for your father. And after what you've gone through, you really need to measure how, you know, what exactly did my father go through? And did you actually ever sit down and find out his side of the story? Or did you just hear your mother talk about her? And essentially, I was trying to bridge that gap and say, we have to look at the conditions that produce our experience. I had elder men in their 70s 
calling me and crying. Like, mm -hmm. I've never had this explained before. And that's what's happening every day to brothers like yourself, to brothers like Kevin. Mm -hmm. This this conversation is bringing in generations of black men that never knew how to explain it. Right, right. You know what I mean? Really? And, and even SMV, man, nobody ever told us we had value, even if it comes right. later in life. We never had right. value. Women right. had intrinsic value. Yes. We were lucky to have them. Right, exactly. Let me, let me ask you this because with what's going on with Kevin, because I have a lot of friends and obviously Kevin had big time people who liked him, but obviously some people may have been afraid to speak on his behalf. I know Brother T.I. has done so. Yeah. Marlon Wayans has done so. Um, and other people that I know liked Kevin probably just won't say anything for fear of that backlash. So I want to talk about that for the everyday black man who may feel that his job may be impacted or, uh, you know, uh, for having these discussions on a public forum. Do you think that because of what's happened to Kevin, uh, you know, since he's passed, that other black men seeing the reactions will be, uh, you know, kind of silent on these issues? And we'll kind of go back to the positions that we were before where black men are not going to talk about these things or are these things going to come more to the forefront now, even more so that Kevin's past. And the, the, the I can't say definitively, but the two reactions I see most are uh, one. I see black men that are speaking up that I hadn't seen speak up before. I see more black men reaching out and asking questions, coming to other channels and, and, and actually communicating with other black men about their experiences more. When I talk about suicide, I get brothers that come in and tell their stories. When I talk about intimate partner violence, I get brothers more who are sharing their stories. And these are guys that have never communicated. I get men that are coming forward saying, I've been listening for six months, but I, you know, I, I haven't said anything. You know, here's a donation. Here's my story. Uh, can you give me advice about X, Y, and Z? So I do think Kevin's death will uh, push some of these brothers to come forward. But at the same time, I'm also seeing more men uh, who are coming forward to distance themselves from Kevin and mark themselves as, you know, good ambassadors as well, you know, sometimes I call them mascots, you know, in, in a way we, where I think many are pandering for different types of female approval. And this is definitely taking place in the academy spaces where brothers are afraid to get fired or lose their job or not be able to pick up a job. I mean, when you go on a hiring committee, if you're dealing with the black academy, as I call it, the black section of the academy, which is technically a fraction of the academy, there are at least 20,000 more faculty, black women faculty than black men. So when you're going up against a hiring committee trying to get hired, chances are you're going to have a, a plethora of black women on the on the hiring committee. And the chances that they're feminists are tend, tend to be fairly high. So, you know, I've sat on many. I've run several. I know how these things work. You got a lot of black men that are worried about whether or not they'll be able to advance. And even if you're on a relatively secure position, if you go public with your positions about black men, um, if you don't get fired, you're at least, you know, it's at least that much more difficult to transition to another job or right. another position. Right. So, you know, so this kind of pandering that I'm seeing coming from, you know, certain types of white collar black men is somewhat expected, but it is booming in response to Kevin. So you have people saying, look, I'm nothing like him. I would never do anything like that. But it's like, OK, you know, th there are some realities that we're going to pretend don't exist. But one of the things that Kevin, you know, pointed out on a very basic level, the more successful you are, man or woman, you know what I mean? Um, you have options that aren't available to others. And what do people generally do? This is why the book Dataclysms by Christian Rudder was so interesting because he looked at over a million different couplings via OkCupid. So he looked at the practices of people and what they choose to do when they're dating. And when they have high value and low value, what are the things that take place? These discussions we're having are not just falling out of the sky. These are based on patterns of human behavior. And at the end of the day, younger women who are more beautiful and, 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 and are technically in a far better position to reproduce tend to have greater options. And they respond to the, uh, those options in very particular ways that tend to be uh, generic patterns that we can see happening over large groups of people. Men who have value in terms of income, in terms of status, tend to do better with women. Why? Because men actually are attracted to beauty and youth and vitality and women are attracted to security. And I'm not trying to oversimplify the dynamic, but there are some overarching patterns to human behavior. I mean, it, so these discussions we're having are long overdue, 
but they're important because they do explain human behavior on a very primal level and it plays out in our dating mating in our day-to-day realities kevin called attention to that and so have many other brothers in this space and more and more black men in particular are starting to listen because a lot of what we're saying a lot of what we're reading a lot of what we're referring to affirms what's happening in their lives so let me ask you a question that people always you know ask um you know in the, in the the black community or the pan African community what is the solution oh you heard that before what's the solution for you know the heterosexual um black male like a kevin samuels or a guy like um that that really wants to stand on his own too um what is that guy gonna look like the guy that's gonna go out there and assert himself and let people know that you know it could be in, in, in a way that i'm not going for x y and z and you know this is what's going on wrong in, in, in black society what 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 will happen what, what will need to happen what kind of work do black men need to do to be able to come to the same points um of acceptance that maybe like some of these you know women that are entitled are able to do what what kind of world do black men need to create to be able to do that in a safe space so what kind of what kind of world do black men need to create to, oh, to let me next say what release. kind, but how, how should, how, what kind of stuff do black men need to be able to do to, to equally come to the same table and say those things? What, to black women? Yes. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely going to take, um, you know, productivity It's going to be, there's going to be some risk taking involved. Brothers are going to have to be very focused, but part of the issue is if we don't also have an understanding of how structure work, structures work, particularly against black men, if you look at the work of people like James Sedanius, Errol Miller, uh, and Robert Staples. If you you know, if you look at the works of these guys, they talk particularly about over generations the way that structures have played a role in targeting and underdeveloping black males specifically. It's not to say that studying those those structures is a way to excuse what's happening with us, but it is a way to understand it, and we can then begin to strategize better about how to navigate and improve our condition. But here again. Kevin is accurate as far as when it comes to black women and men being able to sit down at the table. If black men need to re-strategize or better strategize how to develop and how to substantiate their position, black women are, are going to have to become a lot more realistic about the nature of coupling, the nature of building relationships and what that actually means. And part of the reason for that is you have media, you have a number of institutions in play over the last few decades that taught women that the sky's the limit. So in other words, you can work at a local liquor store making, you know, $9 and there's $6 an hour, whatever, and you should be able to get a millionaire. I mean, this kind of entitled mentality is based off of an unrealistic, you know, media fueled impulse, you know, this kind of Cinderella syndrome, as it were, where, you you know, it, and that that's actually contributed to, a, you know, a, a serious fall in our relationships, because even if she does marry, even if she does procreate with a black man who she believes is beneath her standards, right? It has an impact. I mean, she if she believes she's settling or, you know, somebody, even though she's in dealing with them on a regular basis, that doesn't produce a quality relationship. So in as much as men need to be able to address structure, to study the environment, study the institutions that work for and against them and strategize, particularly with other black men, to build a new environment where we can actually grow uh, and, and resource each other. Women, on the other hand, are going to have to actually become very far more practical about how they even view black men or their relationship options. And once we can have those kind of conversations, I think that can produce a whole different reality. Um, but, you know, the time for doing that is dwindling and you got a lot of people that are burned out on their and how on how they've been treating, especially treated, especially brothers who've been going through this for at least 40 years in one way, shape or form. So when your grandfather and your father have been going through this and you're a young black man hearing these stories, how excited are you to jump into the same fray? Mm -hmm. Especially when girls at your school are acting worse than the girls your father told you about, the girls your grandfather told you about. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? These are the kind, and I'm saying this as a father. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm saying this as a father of a son who whose friends will come to the house and they will talk to me about their experiences. It's getting mm. worse. And if you think race loyalty among Gen X and and millennials is a problem, wait till you see Gen Z. Yeah, that's yeah, that's 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 a very you know that's interesting to talk about, especially 
with the uh, as some of these places are getting more diverse, you know, like New York City, you know, it's it, a lot well, of opportunity. California. Yeah, you already oh know. Yeah, it's just and a lot of times, um, especially for you know, some of these guys who don't have our experience, you know, growing up in black America and you know, now your 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 son or daughter may be growing up in, in the suburbs and they don't even have the same experience as us. Mm-hmm. And and so they're they're not looking at the, the, the world the same way that we're looking at it. Right. And that's the that's what's going on. Um so yeah, we have a lot of problems. But but Doc, I'm not gonna keep you here too much longer. I definitely thank you for coming in. Uh, kind of tell people why they should subscribe to your YouTube channel there. Man, we're 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 developing the conversation, we're developing the vocabulary, we're making sense of black men's experiences and giving giving black men the tools to actually articulate their own experiences. Um, it's it, you know, getting more, you know, people involved to actually produce. I think will only help the conversation that much more. Uh, so, you know, hopefully you'll participate, come in, dialogue, become a brother in the Onyx Report Brotherhood um, or sister for that matter and support so we can build on this and really understand what black men and boys are dealing with from their own voices and not in terms of what other people are saying about us. All right. Give him a round of applause. So I really thank you so much for you know having uh having you on here uh especially under uh the circumstances that we're dealing with guys i want to tell you that uh, those of you who have been supporting um our community um you know in, in the black male space and the black manosphere or just in general in black youtube i want to tell you that uh from the bottom of my heart i thank you for your support i thank you especially the the, the women there's some there's, there's some many women who do love Kevin Samuels? And I want to give them a shout out. Right. Uh, we don't want to you know, disrespect the, the ladies um, that are out there doing that. Th- thank you so much. And uh, any last words, Doc? Well, and, and just to, to what you were saying, a lot of those women, you know, caught a lot of fire too while Kevin was still alive, and definitely as he's passed, you know, they've caught a lot of fire for even listening to him, for even suggesting that he's not always wrong. I mean, a lot of those women got a lot of blowback, and they got called names, they got ostracized, and so shout out to them. For actually just being willing to sit down it ain't about whether you agree with everything it's a matter of are you willing to sit down at the table and the funny part about it is i grew up in the era where the challenge was on the other side where women were challenging us to sit down to the table and hear them and yet you fast forward but you know a few decades later and now it's a it's a problem that black women have to sit at the table so to those women who've been doing so shout out to y'all all right and thank you guys so much i really thank you for uh for being here today and uh subscribe at the bell check out dr t s john johnson's channel below and peace out <laughs>